Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Drink from the Fire Hose, release monitoring.org by Nick Coglin. Nick is a CPython core developer, BDFL delegate for Python packaging interoperability standards, and a founding member of the PSF's Python packaging working group. As a member of Red Hat's package, sorry, platform engineering team, he works on software supply chain management tooling like release monitoring.org for Fedora and RHEL Enterprise Linux. If I can get a round of applause for Nick. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. So moving right along. Securing systems in a networked world. So securing network services is one of the hardest problems uh, in software development. Uh, it's an enormous topic. Uh, and so this talks only about one specific problem in that space. So who's heard of the Open Web Application Security Project? Mm, bit less than half. Uh, so OWASP is a nonprofit foundation that basically aims to look at ways of securing, improving the general state of security on the internet, uh, and particularly for web applications. Uh, and so back in 2013, they put together the OWASP top 10, like the top 10 things that a lot of services get wrong, uh, and that leads to compromises of user data, uh, system compromises, various other problems. Uh, and vast majority of that list is actually things specific to the development of the web applications themselves, like how, how the developers put together the web service. Uh, but number nine uh, is a very different beast, uh, and that's using components with known vulnerabilities. Uh, and this relates to how application developers and service operators manage the pieces they didn't write. Uh, all of the pieces where they said, we found a reusable module, we're just gonna grab that uh, and not worry about that bit. We'll make that somebody else's problem. Uh, and so what this means, update management becomes a key security concern. So I actually work on software supply chain management for Red Hat, uh, and in this issue, it becomes a thing that spans your entire supply chain how the software is published, how publishers are vetted, how components get redistributed, who gets to touch them as they go through the pipeline, uh, and how things actually get deployed. Because it doesn't matter if there's a security update out there if nobody's actually deployed it to their production systems. And one of the traditional ways of approaching this is that people build themselves some hardened bunkers. They minimize the attack service of the deployed services, they put as little in it as possible, uh, and then they patch as needed. They take the security fixes for the known vulnerabilities uh, and just backport those minimal changes. So there's the smallest risk possible of breaking something. But automation enables a different way of tackling this problem. Uh, and what that model is, is people start building moving targets. Uh, and so they regularly discard their old instances and create new ones. Uh, so if, even if someone's got a foothold, it gets blown away as a matter of course uh, within days, minutes, hours. It, it, they, don't get, they don't get to keep a connection even if they've made one. Uh, but people also eagerly upgrade to newer versions of their dependencies uh, and then design their testing and deployment systems accordingly. Uh, because if you're regularly updating to new versions, then you can't afford a manual QA process anymore. Unfortunately for everyone, there's a third option, which is don't do either and make yourself a sitting duck in a tin shed. That's not what this talks about. So, so Linux conference, Linux in the hardened bunker era. Linux distros were born at a time when publishing a piece of open source software pretty much meant putting a tarball on your website. Uh, distro packages then took those tarballs and converted them into their more manageable format of choice, whether it's Debs, app, uh, whatever. Uh, and it was also a situation where automated testing really wasn't a luxury most upstream communities could afford. Uh, so the idea of upstreams doing their own systematic testing just didn't happen. Uh, and so what this meant was that regression and integration testing was left to commercial, commercial vendors. Uh, and we saw the long-term support model for Linux distributions was born. Uh, and what the long-term support vendors do is they provide low-risk, low security updates for a curated core set of critical components. However, times change. The cost of running web services has dropped dramatically uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, and in particular, something we've seen the rise of 
uh, is assorted continuous integration companies uh, and continuous integration as a service companies that have a free for, free for open source projects tier. Uh, and so things like Travis CI, GitLab CI, all that sort of stuff means that a lot more projects, even if they don't have any sysadmins of their own, they don't have anyone who can run custom services for them, they're able to use these free services to do their own testing. Uh, and so it's even becoming common for projects to require that their regression tests pass before a change is merged, uh, let alone uh, checking the changes after they're committed. Uh, and then in addition, most modern language communities uh, actually have a common publishing platform uh, and format. So if people are working in Ruby, they'll probably publish to Ruby Gems. If they're working in Perl, they'll publish to CPAN. If they're working in Python, they'll publish to the Python package index. And so all these improvements in automation and the reduced costs of services are making previously impractical things possible. So one such service is Libraries.io. And Libraries.io is an open source project uh, now backed by Brave New Software uh, that provides developer-focused upstream monitoring. Uh, and specifically, one of the things it enables is it helps application developers to be a moving target. Uh, and it also helps them find new projects that are potentially of relevance to them. Now, this service was launched in March 2015, so it's less than a couple of years old. It's already monitoring more than two million open source projects. Uh, and the way they've achieved this is instead of going and looking for individual projects, they monitor about 33 publishing platforms. Uh, and just by monitoring those platforms, they found more than two million projects. Now, for comparison, some more traditional open source services that have been around for quite a bit longer. Uh, who here has heard of OpenHub? A, a few. Uh, so this is a service run by Black Duck Software, uh, previously called Olo, uh, and it's designed to be a metadata index for open source projects. Uh, and if you go check the public instance at openhub.net, uh, it's been around since 2006. It currently tracks about 700,000 projects. So about a third of what libraries.io has found in a fraction of the time. But one of the earliest open source software indexes was Freshmeet, uh, later renamed to Freecode, uh, and then shut down in 2014. The most it ever found was about 50,000. If we look at Debian GNU Linux, again, around about the 40 to 50,000 mark. Uh, and that's been around since 93. So, uh, almost 25 years. And then similarly, Fedora, about 15 years, around 20,000 projects. We have a two order of magnitude difference between what a distro can provide uh, and what's out there. Uh, and one of the big things here is that these, up, these upstream monitoring and redistribution systems are historically opt-in. Uh, and so it means an extra step for publishers or redistributors. Uh, and so Linux in the moving target era, it's like there's always going to be use cases that call for the carefully built hardened bunkers. So that's going to stay in the realm of the long-term support distros. But these moving targets have different needs, different requirements, uh, and an awful lot of software is moving to deploy on demand models where updates are pushed out automatically uh, and after going through automated regression testing. Uh, and before anyone says, oh, but Internet of Things, well, if you look at services like Resin.io, a lot of the premise of that is that manufacturers retain responsibility for the devices they sell. Uh, and so Resin.io lets people upgrade the systems they deploy. Uh, and so again, even devices can move into that moving target model uh, where they're continuously being upgraded, continuously getting the fixes they need to stay safe on the Internet. Uh, and so in this kind of world, the ro role of Linux distros expands beyond performing QA ourselves, uh, specifically for the distro components, to also better enabling automated quality assurance by other people, whether that's certified software vendors, whether it's by end users, uh, whether it's by uh, distro team members experimenting with different things. Uh, and so li libraries.io is focused on reaching developers directly and feeding uh, things into the software development process. Where release monitoring.org fits in 
uh, is it's a redistributor focused upstream monitor service. Uh, and so in addition to just tracking upstream projects themselves, uh, it aims to maintain an explicit mapping from upstream projects to downstream package names. Because even though distros try, often try to keep uh, consistent naming conventions, they're not always consistently applied. Uh, and of course, every distro has their own conventions. So if you're trying to map packages for a distro you're unfamiliar with, you're not necessarily going to know how they do things. Uh, and so what it will hopefully enable uh, is to system, start systematically automating the process of alerting redistributors to new releases of upstream components, uh, such that people don't have to necessarily react to those manually. Automated systems can step in and say, hey, I've done most of the work. Uh, here is my candidate rebased package. Here is my candidate new package. Could you please take a look at it, see whether it's something you want, see whether you want to upgrade to it, that sort of thing. That's all very abstract, though. So let's have a look at uh, let's have a look at something. Uh, this is running running locally uh, because relying on real-world events makes for a lousy demo. Uh, plus, also conference Wi-Fi. So <laughs> I am relying on it a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, so, so yes, unfortunately, the resolution's a bit high, or a bit low, I should say. I have a mouse pointer here somewhere. Um, so yeah, so basic web service. Uh, I, won't, I won't go through all the things that's there. Uh, so what I will do is I'll jump to this fed message page. So as I was saying, uh, one of the key points here is that is about getting event notifications. Uh, and so the about page basically aims to tell you here is how to subscribe to the automated events rather than here's how to click around in the web UI. Uh, we'll have some more on that later. Um, and in fact, that is the next step. Uh, so, and so what you basically have is uh, init you publishes over a federated message bus, so it's designed to be open access. That, that it's, you don't need special credentials to log in. You can uh, connect to connect to the service and just listen for events uh, and do whatever you want. Uh, and so this is getting a local dev setup running. Uh, find my mouse pointer again. Uh, and what we have here is we have a simple monitor here that is just listening specifically for the, um, specifically for the query, uh, for the topic of the messages that are being sent. Uh, and, so, and so that one will display all of the messages that come through, just whatever topics they're publishing on. Um, we've got another window here, which is specifically monitoring new upstream downstream mappings uh, as they're added. Uh, and then this window here will display results uh, any time a new version is reported. Uh, and so, and this is why we're running locally, so that I can manipulate those events to happen when I want. So if we come back here, we'll jump into adding a new project. Uh, we'll add a project called requests. And we have to tell it where the home page is. Oops. And we'll tell it that it's a Python project coming from the Python package index. Nothing special on the version prefix. Uh, and so one of the things that we can do is we can say, yes, check for releases immediately. So it'll tell us what the latest version is. Uh, and then the other thing I'll do is I'll immediately add a distro mapping for Fedora. Um, and I think it's, called, it's Python requests in Fedora. Uh, and so we can submit that. Uh, and so that goes off uh, and tells us that, yes, request is a thing, uh, and it's currently up to that version there. 
And if we come over to our monitoring window, we will see that we've had a few events come through. Uh, and so we've been told, yes, someone added a new project. Uh, and we have a new version for that project. Someone added a new juice story because this is a completely fresh database, so Fedora was getting added then. Uh, and we've added a new upstream downstream mapping. Uh, and so if we come over here, we can see the events come through to report the report that there's been a new upstream downstream mapping added that tracks from Python requests upstream down to the Fedora project, uh, and that I was the one who added it. Um, and then similarly over here, we've got the notification that a new, a new version has come through for requests, uh, and that we now have a 2.12.4 version for requests. Uh, and then in addition to the asynchronous notifications, you can go straight to the server and say, tell me about Tell me what you know about the upstream Python packaging index project requests. And it tells us, oh, yeah, I know about that. Uh, I know about this is the latest versions we've got. These are the versions it knows about. Uh, and these are the downstream mappings it knows. Uh, and so I'll do one more example of a change. Oh, wait, hang on. One more example of a change. So if someone comes back into this site and says, well, hang on, Debian has that as well. Uh, not really built to be used on a resolution this low. So yes, unfortunately not a responsive design on the website, I'm sorry. Um, so we'll go Debian. Debian calls it the same thing. And so if we add that additional mapping, then again we can come back to the come back to the release notifications. Uh, and you can see more messages have come through for an addition new distro and a new mapping. Uh, and on the on this window you, we have the new mapping coming through for Debian. So, and that's basically the gist of what the service does. It's a relatively simple service, but it translates from those various events uh, into, the, uh, into the asynchronous notifications. Uh, the other thing we can see is if we go to the query window uh, and rerun that request, uh, we've now got both Fedora and Debian in thing. So in this particular case, the names are very predictable. Uh, I wish all distro names were this predictable. It would make my life a lot easier. Um, but yeah, so this lets us start tracking stuff a lot more systematically than we often do now. Um, so if we go back here and moving on. So that's basic what the service does. Uh, set up your mappings, get the notifications. Uh, Folks can, uh, so release monitoring.org itself is completely open. Uh, you log in with OpenID and set up mappings that way. Uh, or people are, it's all open source, so people are free to run their own. Uh, and so exploring some of the components that go into making this. Um, so init year itself, uh, you may have noticed I'm switching back and forth between calling it that and calling it release monitoring.org. Uh, the actual open source project is init year. Uh, so that's, the core web service that handles the upstream downstream mappings uh, and emitting the events uh, when things change. Uh, that's a Python application based on Flask and SQL Alchemy. Runs under both Python 2 and 3, um, mainly because I couldn't stand going back to the old Python 2 tracebacks, which tell you nothing. Um, so, so yeah, so it uh, runs under both Python 2 and 3, currently deployed under Python 2. Uh, and the core concepts in that are obviously upstream projects, track the original publishers of a piece of open source software, uniquely identified by the homepage URL, uh, and again, uh, and this covers both open source libraries uh, and full open source applications. Uh, so that's one of the big differences between this and libraries IO. Libraries IO is specifically focused on the libraries use case, funnily enough. Um, 
Uh, one of the key plugin systems for Anitya um, is monitoring backends, uh, so plugins that can find and report on new releases. Uh, and this is the lowest common denominator plugin uh, is one where you just give it a web page uh, and you give it a regular expression. Uh, and it will peri periodically pull that web page and say, are there any new files there? Um, and this is actually necessary for finding a lot of stuff that's still published in the old upload a tarball to your website model. Uh, a relatively recent addition to the modeling, um, this is adding this is actually when I started getting involved here, uh, is actually modeling ecosystem specifically. Uh, and the difference between an ecosystem and a plugin and a backend plugin uh, is the ecosystem assumes it's actually referring to a specific namespace. Uh, and so, and so, for example, you can't have two different request projects in the PyPI namespace. Uh, and so similarly, CPAN, RubyGems, uh, NPM, they all, in addition to defining a pl publishing platform, they also define a namespace. Uh, and so adding the ecosystems then lets us model that directly and make a few more assumptions about the ecosystems than we can make about the simple publication backends. Uh, we model downstream distributions because otherwise mappings aren't very interesting. Uh, typically, these are Linux distributions, but really they can be anything. Uh, so if somebody wanted to model something like Condor or ConderForge, uh, or they wanted to model the active state language distributions, that's entirely supported just because we're pretty neutral about what a downstream actually is. And then the heart of the whole thing is the actual upstream downstream mappings. Uh, and again, it's just a matter of storing this uh, this particular upstream project is known by this package name within this particular downstream. Uh, and then we convert that into event notifications uh, that go out via federated messaging, uh, which is the other key piece of technology here, because I'm guessing a lot of people wouldn't have heard of that either. Uh, so fed message is, again, uh, Fedora, started as a Fedora infrastructure project. Um, so it's a zero MQ based brokerless messaging protocol. Uh, and basically the idea being that if, you, if all you have is a single publisher and a single subscriber, we don't want you to have to set up a broker specifically and add an additional piece of complexity to your system. Uh, we want you to be able to do direct publish subscribe with just the components you have, uh, if that's what you want. Uh, so the reference implementation is in Python using Twisted. Uh, so it was originally short for Fedora messaging. Um, it got renamed after Debbie and adopted it for a few different things. Uh, so, so yeah, so it was, the name became a misnomer at that point and it was uh, backronymed into federated messaging. Uh, some of the key concepts in that, uh, it doesn't reinvent DNS, it doesn't reinvent service discovery. You just, to say where a fed message endpoint is, you just say, here is the address, here is the port, Go, uh, go make your zero MQ connection. Um, uh, and similarly, because it's an open protocol, the topic namespacing is by convention, uh, and as with anything on the internet, reverse DNS makes a great way of segmenting things uh, and avoiding accidental collisions. Uh, so you can see there, that's got the dev in the name. That's what a niche uses by default when you run it locally. Uh, the uh, the actual release monitoring.org uses a production production namespace that I think it just swaps the dev for prod. Um, I, however, with an open publishing system where anybody can connect, anybody can listen, uh, what you want to do is have a way of uh, ensuring that the message came from whoever cl it claims to have come from. Uh, and so, it has support for both GPG uh, and X509 certification. Uh, and in a lo lot of ways, this is, that's, I think that's the most interesting thing it adds above plain zero MQ. Like zero MQ, you're kind of on your own as to should I trust this message? Uh, with the source authentication in Fed message, it's like, yes, you can, uh, so long as you trust the certificate, uh, however you got hold of that. Um, you couldn't actually see it because of the expanded font, but I was actually running all the fed message commands with a no validate on them. Uh, and that's very convenient for testing because I don't have any valid certs for any of this on my laptop. Um, 
So, and I was very confused the first time I tried to run the demo locally. Uh, but then the last thing, uh, the last uh, Fed message piece I want to talk about uh, is Fed message relay, uh, which I had running in one of the windows there. So Fed message is brokerless by design. Uh, if you don't want a broker, then Fed message doesn't force you to add one. However, brokers are actually useful for a whole bunch of things, uh, and so sometimes you do want one. Uh, and so, for example, Fed message relay, you can set it up so that you can provide a single public endpoint. Uh, and hide the details of your actual deployment architecture uh, and where the messages are coming from and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so init use development config assumes you're locally running relay uh, and then fed message relay lets you do that. So that's basically the service as it exists today. Uh, ReleaseMonitoring.org has a whole bunch of stuff uh, already registered. But there's a lot, of, for, lot more work to do. Uh, and in particular, we're nowhere near the two million library, uh, two million project coverage uh, that libraries I.O. has. Uh, and a large part of that is due to the fact it still mostly runs on that manual registration model. Uh, as you saw, I was having to click through a bunch of GUIs and so forth to actually register new projects and new mappings. So one of the biggest things we're currently working on is OpenID Connect support. Uh, so the currently, the, well, there is a programmatic API and you saw the querying, that, querying the mapping that way. Uh, unfortunately, that's currently read-only, uh, and so all the requests to add new projects and add new mappings has to go through the human-centric web interface. Uh, so we've got a pending patch that adds a Flask RESTful-based API with OpenID Connect support, uh, and what that means is that a lot of those tasks can then be more readily automated. Uh, and so the initial patch is just for uh, upstream project monitoring. We expect uh, more endpoints to be added over time. Uh, and that's all in service. That's all in service of expanding the public data set. Uh, so with that requirement for manual registration has really limited the number of projects we currently have registered. Um, but with better programmatic APIs, then you can automate the task of populating it. Uh, and in particular, um, the one I'm really interested in is ensuring all the Fedora packages are covered. Um, uh, it was pointed out to me earlier this week that the Debian watch file database is a another is going to be another really good source of data. Uh, and, and we should be able to automate uh, tracking everything Debian does as well. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to get contributions from other distributions uh, and build this up into a really good resource of what's shipped where. Um, something we're currently missing from the public data set uh, is quite a lot of projects are missing their ecosystem details. Uh, as I said, that's a relatively recent addition uh, in terms of a service capability, which means previously registered projects we're missing that data. Uh, and the interesting thing we found when we went to add the ecosystem support to the production system, uh, we actually had a lot of duplicates because uh, it turned out that it's like, oh, you need my homepage. That's going to be fine, right? Well, it's like, is the homepage its actual homepage? Is it where the docs live? Uh, is it where the version control system lives? Is it a page on a package index? Uh, is it HTTP or HTTPS? Uh, so, yeah, uh, unique, unique on uh, homepage turns out not to be particularly unique. Um, and so populating the ecosystem's details made that really obvious. Uh, so the duplication has been cleaned up. Uh, that should actually land on the live site sometime this week, hopefully. Uh, and at that point, that by ecosystem query should work for everything that's already registered. More speculatively, uh, I think a libraries I.O. backend is something we're probably going to explore at some point uh, because monitoring the upstream stuff and monitoring the releases, it's just kind of the heavy lifting that somebody needs to do it uh, and everybody doing their own kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so, so it could actually make a lot of sense for us to have a meta backend in Anitya that we still track what ecosystem things are coming from, but then use libraries IO to actually say, well, what releases are out there uh, and when do the new releases happen? They actually have quite a nifty firehose API to actually get that information, similar to our own event stream coming out of Anitya. Uh, and then finally, this one's really more, uh, really more speculative, uh, is the idea that, so at the moment, release monitoring just tracks the upstream releases uh, and then provides the mappings to the downstream uh, projects that need to be notified uh, to say these are the, these are the ones that 
uh, these are the ones that might be interested in this. So there's an additional step you can take, which is track what versions have people downstream actually released, uh, and then start thing. I say, well, this version is shipped here, this version is shipped there. Uh, if you want this, this two stories this far behind for this project. At the moment, we don't track that kind of stuff. It's not clear that it actually makes sense to do it in a NIT year itself. It could probably be a separate service that uses a NIT year as a data source. But it's still an interesting thing of, as we start automating more of this stuff, as we start getting the computers to help us do the job of maintaining the computers, um, there's a lot of potential for interesting things here uh, and helping, helping distros build better metrics for how well we're doing uh, in different respects in terms of just keeping up with the sheer pace of open source. Like open source has exploded in the last 10 years uh, and it's the old ways of doing things aren't going to keep up. Uh, so hopefully that was interesting. <laughs> and uh, I've hopefully convinced you that automated release monitoring is something we should collectively be doing a lot more of. Uh, and yes, yeah, so, and there's definitely plenty to be done in getting more systematic about this. Uh, however, I do think things like libraries.io, releasemonitoring.org give us a god solid foundation to be building on, uh, and so it's going to be an interesting few years. Uh, thank you very much. We, uh, we've got about 15 minutes of, uh, of Q&A if anybody's interested, so over here. Thank you for the talk. Um, two questions, actually. So how do you fix the problem of duplication, like automatically, because there's... Uh, so fortunately, it was a, the, the amount of duplication was small enough uh, that Jeremy was able to just uh, troll, the data, uh, troll a copy of the production database, find the duplicates, and write some SQL to clear them out. Uh, it, yeah, so it, it, was, it was problematic enough to prevent the data migration from working. Um, but, uh, well, plus we also got the constraint violations from the, from the data migration to say, say you have multiple, multiple uh, projects in the same e ecosystem with the same name. That, that was actually how we found it, was, yes. was doing that data migration failed. Okay, okay thanks. And another, so if I understand correctly, everyone can register stuff, right? Everybody got uh, right access? How do you prevent spam? So, so, like somebody re registering some garbage stuff into this you, you, database? Most, mostly through auditing. So, so it's the case of you do, you do need to register, uh, and so everything can be tracked. Uh, and so, so yeah, so it, it, it's, mainly, it's mainly through the sign-up process that, that you have to sign in with OpenID. Uh, and so, so yes. Yeah, so. Um, have you considered just scraping PyPy and other such pa package sources and importing all packages wholesale so that I don't have to go and register everybody's tiny little package that I'm using from over uh, there? Yes, for them? yes. So, so the reason we haven't is that automated registration is a pain at the moment, and this is precisely why we're, we're providing that right API. So we, 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 have, uh, we have a forked version of this which adds the right APIs without authentication. Um, it works really well. Do not run it on the public internet. <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> yeah, so about the authentication part, if someone registers and adds a feed, so you then, on, if, you're, if you're listening for messages, you have to trust certain people? Is that how it works? Uh, so the, the main trust solution is that if if the, the, the idea of collaborative editing on releasemonitoring.org itself bothers you, then you can always run your own and carefully curate what it monitors. Um, and, and that's, we're, we're actually doing that in a couple of cases. Uh, but it's, it's the case of the generic task of uh, monitoring what's out there. It's like, well, Wikipedia works, Fedora works, um, Linux distros work. So it's, it's the case of, so long, so long, the fact that you have to log in uh, and we can audit the activity of everybody using the service, um, I think gives you, gives you the foundation for being able to do this collaboratively in the open rather than everybody having to run their own. 
So. I know you talked about using Debian as a source of info, but what about Debian using this as a source for its watch files? Uh, yes, they, they certainly could. It's just uh, I have personally nothing to do with uh, Debian. I do know they're using FedMessage already, which is one of the nice things about this, that they potentially could do that. Um, but yeah, my, my own personal connection is more to the Fedora and downstream side. Hey, Nick. Um, have you thought about or have people been interested in applications of this beyond software, for example, monitoring uh, data set versions with open um, data publishing platforms and that sort of thing? Uh, I hadn't thought of that, uh, and I wasn't aware of anybody thinking of that, but you're right, it would work because of the custom backend just being a web scraper, basically. So. Yeah, Nick, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, have you, is, is there something on the roadmap that considers uh, metadata sources, for example, so essentially CV sources or something like that, that can be tied back into the release versions. So rather than just the release versions coming in as a feed, to being able to specify a metadata source for releases that can be appended and visualized in the same platform? Not in a knit year itself. Uh, libraries IO does pull in a lot of metadata from other sources. Um, so so that's, that definitely does do a lot of metadata scraping. Um, Libraries.io is actually really cool, if you haven't got that impression. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yes, it, it's, I'm not sure it makes sense for Anitya to do it, but it's certainly an interesting thing uh, around, around what's possible now that, now that we really can scrape the web and, and actually maintain those kinds of data stores. So. So speaking about, um, you just mentioned CDs. Uh, so the one thing is, is that distributions often backport a lot of stuff. And so this version information is useful for upstreams. But since distributions are backporting, like, th there'll be a mapping issue. So well, what so about that? Um, that's what I'm saying. We don't actually track the downstream versions of anything. Uh, and again, that, uh, the, particularly with things like RHEL and CentOS, where th all, the version, all the version of a component in RHEL and CentOS tells you is, this is the oldest code in this version. It tells you nothing about what's been backported since. Uh, so yeah, that, the problem is that actually figuring out what the backports are, you're then talking about actually f going into the distro's version control system, pulling their patch list. And, and, and again, it can be done. It's a simple matter of programming. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's definitely an interesting area is to start and that's that last section of about the downstream version tracking and, and saying what's shipped where and what have they done to it. And yeah, it's certainly interesting. I'm not sure it makes sense to include it in Anitya, but certainly something like that that talk to Anitya as a data source could make a lot of sense. Do we have any other questions? We've got about seven minutes before this uh, session is meant to end, so we have a bit of spare time. I think. I think that's we're it, good. Everyone it. gets an early mark. Thank you very much. Thank you.